All right, good morning, everybody. You guys can come on in and grab a seat, and we will go ahead and get started here. Um, if you don't know me, uh, my name is David. I'm on staff here at Severn, and I get the, the honor of being up here today as we enter uh, week nine of our series called Unfinished, where we're going through the book of uh, First Thessalonians. And uh, today, uh, today, we have the opportunity to talk about a topic called love. And uh, love is a funny thing. Uh, love is something that I think we all like. You know, we all, we all love love, and uh, we all want love. <clears throat> However, if you were to uh, ask 10 random people on the street uh, at random, and you were to ask them, hey, what, what even is love, uh, you'd be hard-pressed to get the same answer twice. Uh, so to, uh, to illustrate this idea, I actually did my own online survey, actually it was just a Google search, uh, but I have five descriptions of love that I want to read to you guys from people you'll probably recognize at least most of them. <clears throat> so I'm just going to read through those to illustrate this idea. Uh, so number one, love is an intense feeling of deep affection. That's Mr. Dictionary or maybe Merriam-Webster if you prefer that. Um, number two, love is a serious mental disease. Uh, <laughs> That was, uh, that's Plato, probably Plato after a breakup, if I had to guess. But, uh, <clears throat> number three, uh, life is the flower for which love is the honey. It's very beautiful, maybe not very practical, but that's Victor Hugo. And uh, number four, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. I like that one. That's Martin Luther King Jr. And this is the last one, number five, and these are in no particular order, but number five is that Love is only a dirty trick played on us to achieve continuation of the species. Uh, <laughs> so that's uh, W. Somerset Malcolm. He's a famous playwright and author from the early 1900s. But anyways, in those five descriptions, we have love uh, described as a feeling. We have it described as a disease. We have it described as honey and as a force. And lastly, as a dirty trick. So uh, needless to say, there's not a unanimous consensus among our scholars here as to... Uh, to what love is. So that kind of begs the question, you know, what, what really is love? And, and how, how do I love well in my daily life? And uh, that's what we're going to look at today as we go into uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 9 through 12. I'm just going to read through the passage first, and then uh, we'll kind of walk through it here today. So uh, again, 1 Thessalonians 4, I'll start in verse 9. <clears throat> About brotherly love, you don't need me to write you because you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. In fact, you are doing this toward all the brothers in the entire region of Macedonia. But we encourage you, brothers, to do so even more, to seek to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, so that you may walk properly in the presence of outsiders and not be dependent on anyone. <clears throat> so right at the beginning of this passage, uh, we see in verse 9, he says, he says, about brotherly love, uh, you don't need me to write you because you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Um, and this actually brings us to our first main idea today, and that's number one, uh, that love needs to be learned. So we see they had to be taught by God, which means these Thessalonian people, they needed to, to learn to love, and we're continuing to learn to love. And the same is true for me and for you. And that idea on the front end might seem a little bit strange to us, because I think a lot of times we just feel like love is innate in us, or we just naturally know how to do it, and we should naturally be good at it. Um, but I want to read one more quote don't worry, I'm not just going to read quotes the entire time I'm up here. Uh, but one more quote for you. This is by a guy named Leo Biscalia. He was a famous author and he was a professor at University of Southern California. Some people called him Dr. Love because he wrote about love so much. Uh, but this is a quote he has. He says, most of us never learn to love at all. We play at love. We imitate lovers, treat love as a game. Is it any wonder so many of us are dying of loneliness, feel anxious, and unfulfilled, even in seemingly close relationships, and are always looking elsewhere for something more, which we feel must certainly be there. And I just feel like that's a sobering quote. It's a quote that kind of speaks into our reality, and it really makes us ask the question, you know, have I ever really learned to love at all? And we have to, we have to start here, because otherwise we can live our, our whole lives thinking that we're being loving, thinking that we're doing things that are loving for other people, um, and at the end of our life we realize we've completely missed the point. So what, what was it that the Thessalonians had been taught by God? How had they learned from God to love? And, and how can we learn from God to love? Because this idea of, you know, being, being taught by God, that can be kind of intimidating, maybe confusing, because uh, me and you, we can't go to the local community college, we can't go to AACC and sign up for, you know, Love 101 and, and God's our professor. You know, we can't do that. We can't just go sign up for that. 
Um, however, every single one of us, we actually can be taught by God to love just like the Thessalonians were. And maybe your mind first goes to, um, you know, yeah, we could read 1 Corinthians 13, which if you don't know, that's the love chapter. That's, you know, love is patient, love is kind, etc. cetera. Um, the, the chapter that everyone has read at, the, at their wedding. But um, <clears throat> what's interesting to note is that uh, these people, they didn't have that chapter. They didn't have 1 Corinthians 13 because it wasn't written yet. <laughs> so the way they would have learned to love from God would have been a little bit different uh, than reading a chapter, which is a good idea to read that chapter, but they would have learned in a different way. And the first way they would have learned was by looking at the life of Jesus, a.k.a. God in the flesh. Because when Jesus was here, he told us, he said, that we should love one another the way that he loves us. Which that means that, you know, we should always be asking the question, always be pondering. We can never ask the question too many times. You know, how does Jesus love us? What does that love actually look like? And just to give a few descriptions of it, you know, his love for us is unconditional. You know, he loved us when we least expect it. He loves us when we least deserve it. His love is sacrificial. You know, he laid down his life for us. He humbled himself. He served. He was patient. He was kind. He was gentle. You know, his love is limitless and endless. And I could go on and on talking about what Jesus' love looked like. But what we, what's so important to see is that when we look at Jesus, we can actually begin to see what love really is. Because while the Thessalonians couldn't read 1 Corinthians 13 and read that Jesus was patient, and, or that love is patient and kind, they could see in Jesus' life that love is patient and kind. Because they, they were told about Jesus by Paul. So they knew, could have still known what love was by looking at Jesus. Because at the end of the day, in, in God's word, we see that uh, God is described, he's described, as, it says, God is love, which that's an amazing statement in and of itself. But then we're told that Jesus, aka God the Son, he's, he's the exact representation of God's nature, which just to think through that, he's the exact representation of that nature of, of love. So that means that Jesus is not just an example of how to love. He's not just a good example. He's actually the definition of love. He's the definition that we have to look to if we want to learn to love. The second way that, that these people would have learned or been taught by God to love, just like we can, is through the Holy Spirit. So if you've given your life to Jesus, anyone who's given their life to Jesus and is a follower of Jesus has the Spirit of God living in them, which that's something I think is hard to understand, it's something I don't think we fully, we fully grasp, it's something we can take for granted. But one of the things that God's Spirit does for us, the Holy Spirit, it teaches us. And it says he teaches, and he teaches us through taking that head knowledge of, you know, okay, this is what Jesus did. This is the way he loved. It takes that head knowledge and it drives it down into our hearts and it makes it real to us where then it can begin to change us from the inside out. We can begin to actually see the implications of this kind of love and we can begin to live it out in our own daily lives. So we're able to learn how to love through looking at Jesus' life and, by being, and following his leading in our lives. And I think this idea that, that love needs to be learned, it should be, be both encouraging to us and also challenging to us. So it should be encouraging to us because maybe you showed up today and you just feel like you're not really that good at loving people. You know, maybe you feel like you're not the best spouse or you're not the best parent or you're not the best friend or sibling or whatever. Fill in the blank there. <clears throat> well, the good news is we can grow in that area. You can grow. You can learn to love. Because maybe you've, you know, just kind of come in feeling like you're weird because you don't just naturally feel loving or you don't naturally, it's not easy for you, you don't just fall into love, which is the kind of language we use to make it sound like it's just some easy thing, but it's not. It's something that needs to be learned, which means there'll be a lear learning curve, you know, as we figure out how to do it well. So it should be encouraging to us, but it should also be challenging to us because you might have also walked in here today and never even considered this idea because you've just assumed which I think we can so easily do, we just assume that we know how to love or that we're good at loving or we're, you know, we're just naturally good at loving people. But what we see here is that love needs to be learned. So that means each and every one of us, we still have some learning to do. So <clears throat> that's what we see first here is that, that love is something that is learned. And then the next two verses, we'll see kind of how it can look just in our everyday lives. So after he says them that, you know, they've been taught by God to love one another, this is what he says in verse 10 and 11. He says, in fact, you are doing this toward all the brothers in the entire region of Macedonia. But you encur we encourage you, brothers, to do so even more, to seek to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. <clears throat> and this will bring us to our, our second main idea today, which is number two, that love needs to be practiced. So look at the, the language that Paul uses here. He says, you're, he, when he tells them to love one another or that they've already, you know, been taught by God to love one another, he says, you're already doing this, so do so even more. He doesn't say, you already feel this way, 
so feel so even more. Which I'm not even sure how you would do that. How do you, you know, double your feeling for something? I don't know. But he says you're doing this, so do so even more. Which means that love is not just a feeling. It's not just something that's learned. It's something that's lived. It's an action. It's active. It needs to be practiced in our daily lives. And then he tells us what that might look like. He says to seek to lead a quiet life, mind your own business, and work with your own hands. Which uh, is pretty surprising, you know, for, for me to see that's what, where Paul goes with that. It's pretty surprising because the guy who wrote this letter, uh, Paul, he went on all kinds of, like, epic missionary journeys. And he was shipwrecked, and he was beaten, and he ran from people who wanted to kill him. So at the very least, you know, I expect something that's a little more exciting or dangerous or something. But what I think is so important about this, what we can see here is that what we're being shown is that the ability or the, the place where we can love more and more, it's just in our daily life. So what I want to do is just look through each of these things that he says. So first, to, to seek to lead a quiet life. And this idea of leading a quiet life, it's, it's descriptive of, of someone who stays at home, does their own work, and does not officiously meddle in the affairs of others. So that's the first way that Paul says we can love people more and more around us, is by, by not meddling in their affairs in a way that's offensive or aggressive or you know, busting in and trying to fix things. It says to, to not officiously meddle in other people's affairs. So... He's not saying you should just stand idly by or be apathetic towards other people, you know, stand idly by while their life, you know, falls apart. There's definitely room for instruction and encouragement. And, and um, you know, obviously he wrote this letter. So he was writing a letter to his friends to encourage them and instruct them. But what he is warning against is arrogantly forcing your way into someone else's business to, you know, try to fix them on your own. Or, or really, I think one way we can kind of disguise this in the church world is to, you know, speak truth to somebody. But we're speaking truth with just the intention of clearing our own conscience as opposed to actually wondering how that's going to impact the person we're talking to. So what came to mind when I was looking at this idea was, uh, was the character Wilson from the show Home Improvement, which uh, hopefully I'm not the only one who has you know, seen that show. I think it, maybe it's still popular. As a, I, okay, good. I'm not alone. Um, so as a kid, I never watched it. But as an adult, I've watched reruns of this show, and I think it's hilarious. But, um, but anyways, Wilson is Tim Allen's neighbor in that show, in case you don't know. And uh, Tim Allen can always go back in his backyard and uh, talk to Wilson over his fence. And uh, Wilson is a good friend. He's always willing to listen, to ask questions, to draw Tim out, and provide his sage wisdom. And uh, what's, uh, what's unique about Wilson, though, so he's a good friend, he's always willing to be there, but he always stays on his side of the fence. So that's what we're being told here. A way that we can love people more and more in our daily lives is just not imposing on them. Just very practical, down-to-earth things. The second thing we see here is uh, to mind your own business, which is just kind of the, the other side of the coin of seeking to lead a quiet life. Because while seeking to lead a quiet life is about not sticking your nose in other people's business, minding your own business is making sure you're taking ownership and taking care of your own business in your life. Because the word there literally means to, to attend to one's own stuff or practice one's own things. So this can sound a little counterintuitive because it's saying the way that we can love other people more and more is to make sure that that you've got your business in order, but what's um, helpful, I think, in understanding that is thinking of how Jesus spoke uh, when he talked about making sure you have the log out of your own eye before you try to get the speck out of your neighbor's eye so you can see clearly. So that's the second thing he says, mind your own business. The third thing he says is to work with your own hands. And uh, this is kind of speaking to the idea of not being idle, not being lazy, but it's also pointing to the value of all, all lines of work. Because in Paul's day, <clears throat> working with your own hands was actually seen as lowly, like using your hands to work. Your, uh, your status um, or your respectability in society was directly proportionate to the amount of work you could delegate and do through the agency of others versus doing with your own hands. So what Paul is saying here would be very you know, countercultural. Counter -cultural. He's saying no matter where you work, uh, no matter what line of work you're in, you have an opportunity to love people through the way you go about your work, regardless of what your job is. And that there's value in doing what God has put before you to the best of your ability. So those are the three things we see. Seek to lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. Work with your own hands. Maybe not what we would expect, you know, after being told to love more and more. But what I think is so, so helpful about that is it speaks into the everyday lives of everyday people like you and like me. So it's saying that no matter where you live... No matter where you work, it doesn't matter. Every day you have an opportunity to live in a way that's respectful of others and is, is loving towards other people. And I think uh, this is so helpful to us because it's accessible. You know, could you, could you imagine how deflating it would be if Paul had said, okay, you're, you're doing a good job loving, now love more and more, 
and that means that each of you need to move to a foreign country by this time next week. Or if he'd said, oh, you're doing a great job, but you need to love more and more, and the way that looks is you have to be an outspoken public figure who raises money and awareness for a good cause. Or maybe this will hit a little closer to home to anyone who was you know, raised in the church, is, hey, you're doing a good job loving, you need to love more and more, which means you have to work full-time at a church. Which none of those are bad things, but that's not what he said. And why I think that's so important to note is it's not, this isn't God saying that, you know, you should just resign yourself to a life of boredom and purposelessness. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying we need to see, we need to be shown the purpose that already exists in our everyday lives that we're so prone to miss. Because we can think in these big grandiose terms of I have to do these big things, but he's saying, no, it's in your daily life. And um, that means that regardless, if you work at a construction site, in a cubicle, if you're a stay-at-home mom, regardless of where you live, every single day you have opportunity to love people by the way you go about your life, the way you go about your day. And uh, these ideas, these three ideas, I think would be very easy to, um, you know, take them and say, okay, so the best way to live is to buy a cabin in the woods and mind my own business and work with my own hands. I'm just, you know, I'm just minding my own business and just trying to isolate from the world. But that would be a logical conclusion if verse 12 did not exist. So in verse 12, the last verse in this little passage, uh, Paul gives us the why behind everything he's just walked through. He gives us the reason why we should live this way. So he says, hey, you've been taught by God to love one another. Do it even more. And then he says, it could look like this in your daily life, and here's why you should live that way. So verse 12, he says, so that you may walk properly in the presence of outsiders and not be dependent on anyone. So this brings us to our third and, and our final idea today, which is uh, number three, that love breaks down barriers. So the first two ideas we looked at today were more about what love is, what it looks like in our daily life. This is about what love does. Because we see the whole reason we should live this way is to be able to walk properly or respectably in the presence of outsiders and be dependent on, not be dependent on anyone. So just to clarify, whenever... Paul wrote this letter, he wrote it to Christians. So when he says the term outsiders, he's just talking about people who don't believe what they believe. So this passage that starts off talking about brotherly love or love between Christians, it doesn't limit it to that. It expands it out to everybody at the end because the whole reason we should live this way is so that we're walking respectably among people who don't believe what we believe. We don't agree with what we believe. So it's interesting that he puts such an emphasis on what the outsiders think of the way a Christian lives because I think so... So often in the church, so often as Christians, it's really easy to get in this us versus them mindset where we can think, you know, who cares what the world thinks? And it's us versus the world, and, you know, we just need to prove them wrong. You know, it doesn't matter what they think. But the way that that Christianity, Christianity teaches is that we should try to live peaceably among all men, regardless of what they believe, as much as it depends on us. And that our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other people. So what we're seeing here is that there's an emphasis on what the outsider thinks, which that might sound weird to you. You know, we're saying we should be mindful of the way we live. We should be, actually care about what they think about way, the way we live. And if that sounds weird to you, then, then what Paul wrote in 1 Timothy will sound even weirder to you uh, because he wrote another letter that's in our New Testament called 1 Timothy. And in that letter, we see the, the requirements for being a leader in the church. So like what it takes to be like one of the top level leaders in God's church And one of the requirements is that they're thought well of, that they have a good reputation among outsiders. Which that's kind of crazy when you think about it. That the way that one of the requirements to be a leader in the church is that the people outside the church think highly of you. So that just begs the question, you know, begs the question, why? Why does God care so much about, you know, the outsider? And I think it's um, just, we get a crystal clear answer when we look at the life of Jesus. Because when Jesus was here on this planet, he made a beeline for outsiders. He befriended and loved tax collectors and Samaritans and prostitutes, people who the Jews hated and just definitely ostracized as outsiders. And before, before Jesus got a hold of Paul's life, the guy who we used to write this letter, or before he got a hold of anyone's life here, your life, my life, anyone who calls ourselves a Christian, every single one of us was an outsider. So the reason that it matters how we live in our daily life, the way we go about our daily life like it's described here in this passage, is because the way we live, the way we love in our everyday lives can have the potential to point someone else to Jesus so that their life can be completely transformed and so that they can be brought in to God's family and brought into a family that, you know, they could have never got in on their own because 
Love breaks down barriers. That's what Jesus did for us. Whenever Jesus was here, he drove home this idea too. He said, let your light shine before men so they can see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. He's saying the way you live can point people to him. So that, I think, raises a question for anyone here who would, you know, who would call themselves a follower of Jesus or would, if you'd call yourself a Christian here today, it raises a question we should ask ourselves. We should ask ourselves, hey, what's my reputation among the people in my life who don't believe what I believe? You know, what do the people in my life who don't agree with me, don't believe what I believe, what do they think of me? And I think that question assumes something. It assumes we actually, you know, have friends who don't agree with everything we believe. We actually spend time with them. Which this, uh, this passage where it says, walk properly in the presence of outsiders, that phrase, in the presence, it connotates close connection, even close relationship. So this completely, you know, blows the idea of isolation just out of the water. You can't, you can't isolate yourself. It's saying you should be walking properly in the presence of people who don't agree with you. Now, what I'm not saying, I'm not saying that everyone's always going to like you. I'm not saying you should aim to be a people pleaser. You know, when Jesus was here, he was not a people pleaser. He was a polarizing figure. However, he was also constantly accused by the religious elite of being a friend of sinners because of the way that he embraced people who would have been considered outsiders. So what we have in this passage here, we have, we're, we're shown that every single day, you and I have opportunities to live in a way that's full of love, and respect for other people, and that's respectable even among people who would completely disagree with us. So that people should be able to say, hey, look, you know, I don't know about all that Jesus stuff, but that guy is a great employee. Or I don't, I don't know if we agree on everything as far as what life's all about, but they are awesome neighbors. Or she's the best boss I've ever had. Or yeah, you know, he always, he's always inviting me to church, and it's kind of annoying, but that's my best friend. You know, people should be able to say that about us. We shouldn't we shouldn't isolate from people who disagree with us or who have different ideas than us, get this us versus them mentality that we can so easily fall into. We have to forget that because love can break down barriers. But the only way that we're going to be able to live in this way where we actually love in the way that, that it's practiced in our daily life and that it has the, the, the power to break down barriers is if we go all the way back to that first idea. We have to learn to love from Jesus. We have to learn to love from the one who loved outsiders enough to die for us. But I'm going to call up the, the worship team, and we'll, we'll kind of wind down here today. So, um, so we had a chance to talk about love today, and, and we had a chance to look at the fact that Jesus is the, the perfect picture of love. He's the definition of love that we have to look to and learn from if we want to learn to love well in our daily lives. So I want to encourage you this week and this month, this year, as you go home, to purposely set aside time, which got an extra hour today, so you have no excuse. Uh, you can set aside time to just think about and read about and pray about the way that Jesus loves you. And that's something that's never a waste of time. And it's, it's worth doing whether right now you call yourself a Christian or right now you would say you're not a follower of Jesus. You can spend time thinking about and reading about and praying about the way that Jesus loves you. And if you're here today and you would say that, you know, maybe you feel like an outsider when you come to church. Maybe you feel like you know, you, you just know you haven't given your life to Jesus and you feel a little bit like an outsider when you come here. We just want you to know we are so happy that you're here. We want you to know that you are always welcome here. And you, we just want you to be able to come here week after week after week as you try to figure this thing out. And we'd love to walk alongside you through that. And the other thing I'd like to say to you is you don't have to stay on the outside. The whole reason that Jesus came down, the reason he, he died, he gave his life for you was so that through trusting in him, you could be brought into his family. He's broken down all the barriers that would keep us all outside. He did that himself so that we could be brought into his family. So you don't have to stay outside. Now today we get the opportunity to do uh, communion. We get to celebrate communion together. We get to remember in a tangible way. We get to remember when God demonstrated his love for us in the most clear way possible, that while we were still sinners, while we were still far from God, while we had never done anything to clean ourselves up, we hadn't, we hadn't come around, we hadn't learned something new, while we were still sinners and enemies of God, that Jesus died for us. So when we take the, the bread today, when we take the juice to remember what Jesus done, I just, I just want you to, to really reflect for a moment. Take some time to think about what kind of love is this really that Jesus has for me? Because it's a love that can completely change you. Thanks.